would now be a reasonable time to start. So first of all, I'd like to say uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for attending this first of uh, four uh, BSET uh, webinars that we're doing. Uh, and welcome to people from across the world who have uh, registered for this, which hopefully, you know, has worked at a good time slot. This is the first one today on uh, uh, the ruptured uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, we've got following up ones, which we'll show you some timings of as well, coming up on the strategies for managing acute lower limb ischemia in the patient with COVID, uh, strategies for early thrombus removal and acute DVT, and uh, strategies for rescuing iatrogenic uh, vascular injuries. Um, I'd like to say very much thank you to our sponsors, Medtronic, for uh, being behind us today, and to our uh, panellists who are coming to us from across the world. Uh, my name's Paul Beavis. I'm a vascular surgeon at uh, the Bristol Bath and Western Vascular Network in, uh, in Bristol, uh, where I'm the lead for complex endovascular surgery and uh, also a council member for uh, BSET. Uh, my co-moderator today is uh, Celia Riga. Uh, Celia is uh, a consultant at Imperial College in London, as well as being a consultant senior lecturer and head of the School of Surgery, uh, so, as well as being the uh, unit training lead as well. Celia. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, good morning or good evening to all. Uh, we have uh, people joining from Argentina to Vietnam uh, and at the same time we have an excellent panel of experts um, that I wish to introduce, starting with uh, Simon Nikwe. Simon is a consultant uh, vascular surgeon um, in Liverpool and a BSET council member. Hello Simon. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Shireen Shalhoub, who is also a, a vascular surgeon, associate professor of surgery at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, Shireen has a special interest in connective tissue disorders and genetically triggered aneurysms, and she's the vice chair uh, of the National Registry uh, for Genetically Triggered Aneurysms in the US. Welcome, Shireen. I'd like to introduce uh, Andrew Chung, uh, a good friend and previous colleague who is a vascular surgeon and associate professor at the Department of Surgery at the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine uh, at the National University of Singapore. Hello, Andrew. And last but not least, Baron Mies, Associate Professor and Deputy Head of the Department of Vascular Surgery in Maastricht. He's also the Director of EVC and the Secretary of the Dutch Vascular Society. And to kickstart the session, there is a poll, uh, a poll question for you all, which hopefully can be shared on the screen. So vascular and endovascular specialists should not be performing ruptured AAA repair if they do not offer AAA repair in their elective practice. Yes or no? We'll give you all some time to vote. And as we're doing this, we'd like to encourage participation during the webinar uh, with, in the Q&A section. Please type any questions that you wish to raise and uh, Paul and I will try and facilitate the discussion as much as possible. Is there a timer for this, Jeanette? No, no timer set for this. Okay, we'll give people some time to settle in and vote. before we start with the first presentation. Brilliant. So I personally agree with the audience. Um, Simon, what are your views before you, you, you start? I, I was very disappointed. I, I couldn't vote there. It says hosts and panelists can't vote, but I, I'd, I'd strong. I'd be a strong yes on that. I think um, uh, 
you need to be a, a regular um, a regular operator, whether it's endovascular or open, uh, ideally both. Uh, if you're going to offer um, a, an emergency service, you need to be able to get yourself out of trouble um, and to be, you, you and your team uh, need to be practiced. Indeed, and I entirely agree that it should be not just the primary operator, but the team as well, that they should be used to performing uh, uh, AAA repairs in their elective daytime uh, practice. Fantastic. Simon, welcome. It's a great pleasure to, to, to welcome you to the virtual podium. Um, when you're ready, please start with your presentation. Hello, Celia. Yes, sorry, we can see I, your I, slides. You can see my slides. I'm sorry, I, I, I lost you there for, for a minute or so. Uh, right, so I'll kick off. Um, so my name is Simon Nico. I'm a vascular surgeon in Liverpool. Uh, I specialise in, in aortic surgery, uh, primarily endovascular, uh, but um, uh, I do the full uh, range of um, open surgery uh, also. Um, so we as a group are going to be talking about um, strategies for managing uh, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms uh, and hopefully uh, we'll cover uh, this uh, list of um, topics. Um, essentially I'm going to focus on uh, talking about planning and strategy, uh, team working. I'll talk a little bit about equipment and technique but my colleagues will pick that up uh, later on. Uh, in the um, uh, in the webinar, so I'll, I'll start really with with uh, bits and pieces on planning and, and strategy. So we'll kick off. Um, Staff are alerted to an emergency admission. We've just received a fast break call to let us know that there's a potential ruptured AAA en route from um, H Hospital. So the theatre team are now getting the theatre prepared. Aintree a and &E is transferring a patient to the Royal, home to the region's vascular centre. We go straight for the midline to get the clamp on. If you remain stable, then we can turn him over onto the left-hand side and we can access his erythroperitoneal. He has an abdominal aortic aneurysm, known as a triple A, a rupture of the aorta, the body's main blood vessel. So I'd, I'd recommend when you next have your rupture come in, you, you have a television crew uh, on standby, uh, filming your, your your operating theatres is quite handy to to get a look at what your what your actual practice looks like. Uh, so this case um, I'll go through is a 73 year old male uh, who'd presented to a neighbouring hospital uh, with severe abdominal pain radiating to the back. Um, he was hemodynamically stable uh, and previously fit and well. Um, he was uh, 30 minutes uh, away from uh, from our unit. Um, I'll show you his scan. Uh, so it's a contained rupture, uh, in fairness, so uh, less, less of a disastrous um, presentation uh, than these things can be. Um, but when I show you the neck uh, of his aneurysm, uh, things become uh, less attractive. Uh, so juxtarenal uh, aneurysm, uh, a significant challenge uh, electively. Uh, and here we have uh, a guy coming in uh, as a rupture. Uh, so no simple uh, endovascular option uh, for us in this uh, regard. Uh, importantly, uh, no simple open uh, option uh, for, for this case either. And this is where uh, it comes down to that, um, that expertise of both the primary surgeon uh, and the team. Um, it just so happened that um, the, the surgeon on call uh, for this uh, particular day uh, was one of our senior surgeons uh, who routinely does um, retroperitoneal approaches uh, electively uh, for juxtarenal, power renal, uh, and indeed suprarenal aneurysms, uh, which meant that this was um, relatively straightforward uh, to handle. I'll show you the video from that. Bye. Turn him on his side. There's eight minutes for negative 
So I'm going to mute the video and I'm going to talk over it. So here we have a, um, uh, uh, an experienced vascular anaesthetist um, anaesthetizing for, uh, for this case. We have uh, our senior uh, aortic surgeon uh, on call, uh, which means that what is a difficult uh, repair uh, is turned into uh, an almost elective uh, repair, uh, just done uh, uh, without delay. Uh, so uh, rapid transit uh, into theatre, uh, theatre team uh, ready, uh, surgeon scrubbed, uh, patient put to sleep quickly um, and managed, uh, managed appropriately. Now, the point uh, I will make to you um, is that that doesn't happen uh, by chance um, and that planning really does matter uh, for uh, managing ruptured aneurysms. It isn't an accident that um, uh, uh, there are um, uh, networks in place for rapid uh, transfer of patients. Um, it isn't an accident that you have, you'll have uh, the necessary uh, surgical expertise available appropriate critical care support um, and good relationships with the blood bank uh, and mechanisms um, set up to to activate um, those emergency uh, pathways. Now we know this because we've looked at our practice and we're terrible or we were terrible uh, in fact. Um, if you presented locally uh, within our uh, emergency department it still was taking us uh, three hours uh, to get you into the operating room, whether you had an, an open repair uh, or, uh, or an endovascular repair. Uh, it's even worse if you turn up to one of our spoke sites uh, where it takes us half a day uh, to get you from, uh, from the emergency department when you walk through the door um, into the operating uh, theater if you present uh, with a ruptured aortic aneurysm. Now, no matter how fit you are, that um, degree of delay is always going to be uh, an issue in terms of your uh, ability to, to withstand uh, the blood loss, um, uh, what sort of complications you're going to develop uh, afterwards from, uh, from your rectal peritoneal your hematoma, etc. So the uh, Society of Vascular Surgery have looked at this. Um, and they've, uh, they've, they've come out with a guideline uh, suggesting that um, ideally uh, we should be getting our patients into the operating theatre uh, within two hours of their arrival uh, in the hospital. Uh, so we, we've adapted uh, this, um, uh, this guidance or this 90 minute uh, target um, and we've looked at how we make it work uh, for our patients. Um, and we've, we've used that to develop um, our patient pathway uh, for ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms. Now, this, this was developed by uh, the multidisciplinary group sitting down and looking at what actually needs to happen uh, to move a patient smoothly uh, from point A to point B and have the right expertise available. Um, and the really interesting thing about it is that actually it all boils down uh, to communication um, because we as a team, uh, both the surgical team, the theatre team, um, our radiologists, our radiographers are all vastly experienced at dealing with um, elective aneurysm uh, uh, practices. Um, our issue was that um, it was taking such a long time uh, to uh, communicate with the necessary people uh, to let them know uh, what the plan was and the, what the plan may change uh, from open to endovascular. Uh, you needed to know who you had available, which theatre was available. Um, you need to let the blood bank know uh, what's, what's coming up. So the, the main thing uh, with the pathway was um, uh, uh, producing formal um, channels for rapid communication uh, through the switchboard um, to all the appropriate um, teams. We also clarified what actions were required by different individuals, so um, never losing sight of the priority 
in terms of managing a ruptured aneurysm, which is to control the rupture, uh, i.e. Uh, whatever you do, nothing matters beyond getting to a theatre and getting the aorta controlled, whether that be a clamp, uh, an intraortic balloon, or uh, your definitive um, uh, endovascular repair. Nothing matters beyond uh, getting control of rupture and everything else uh, is around de delivering that uh, quickly. In terms of what we do in theatre, I think that standardizing, standardizing the setup uh, really is key. So it's knowing that whether you're going open or whether you're going endovascular, uh, your priority is the same. It's again, this control of rupture. It's getting the patient onto the table prepped. It's right arm out, whether it's open or endovascular, it's the right arm belongs to the anesthetist, uh, meaning that you can get your C arm in, uh, you can prep the patient for, uh, uh, can prep the groins, you can get um, arterial access um, while, the, while the anesthetic work is going on if you're going down the endovascular route. If you're going down the open surgical route, uh, it means pre preparing the, the abdomen uh, while the patient goes off to sleep, uh, which I think is, is pretty much standard uh, in these cases now. So in terms of ruptured equipment for ruptured aneurysms, um, important to keep it simple and to have it available. Uh, so we have a, uh, we have a, a small uh, emergency consignment of, um, of grafts within our hybrid theatre. Uh, we have a box of stuff uh, for endovascular cases uh, because we recognise that at night um, we may not have our standard um, endovascular trained uh, theatre team. Uh, so it's important to be able to simply open a box and have um, the ancillary kit uh, immediately available for that uh, case rather than having to pull uh, stuff off the shelf. This means that your surgeon can go straight to theatre uh, and, uh, and, and, and wait for the patient uh, rather than uh, going up and down. Systems testing I think is important um, and one of the things that we've done is, um, do the, is, is run the uh, uh, the pathway from uh, from A and E uh, to theatre to the table, uh, do, doing doing dummy procedures uh, uh, to groove the various members of the team, test the system. So how 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 does the bleep system work? Um, how do, how does the blood bank know that you need uh, uh, a rapid uh, massive transfusion protocol? How do the porters know uh, where where to go and what their roles are? Uh, the only way to do that is by either having lots and lots of ruptures, which nobody nobody has anymore, or uh, or, or systems testing through uh, through simulation. So, the benefit of all that training um, is that um, you do get better. Uh, so I'll tell you uh, another story of uh, a case done a couple of weeks ago. So this time, uh, an eighty-year-old um, uh, sports physiologist. Um, who was uh, very fit uh, for his age, uh, thankfully for him, uh, because he had been admitted uh, two days uh, previous to this uh, in urinary retention at uh, one of our regional hospitals. Uh, speaking to his wife, she gives a very clear description of him having uh, this nasty pain in his kidney area, which she was very uh, worried about, of course. Um, He'd been catheterized and he did indeed have a large uh, residual volume, uh, but he also had an abdominal aortic aneurysm uh, picked up on ultrasound on day one, uh, which uh, in retrospect should have uh, possibly triggered some alarm bells. But um, in any case, he collapsed uh, early in the morning uh, on day two uh, whilst going to the toilet. Um, uh, due credit, he was put through the CT scanner uh, fairly quickly. Uh, it took a while for the report to come back. Uh, it took even longer, it took another hour for the vascular surgery team uh, to actually be re uh, referred to the patient. Um, so that 15 minutes uh, there is an important time. It's a, it's a, it's a funny, funny thing because that referral process itself takes time, uh, and I hadn't appreciated this until we started um, examining what happens in these cases. It does take 15 to 20 minutes to 
take that um, uh, referral information. Uh, but what you what you can do is you, it is use that time, which is what we did in this case. In that, um, whilst the registrar was uh, taking details and, and and having a conversation, um, we, there happens to be two consultants sitting around uh, who uh, reviewed the imaging while the conversation was going on uh, and actually had planned the uh, the endograft uh, by the time the the conversation was was over. Um, patient was in our hospital an hour later, so not brilliant, but um, uh, from there uh, we, we picked things up, uh, had the patient in theatre uh, within 20 minutes um, and uh, a procedure uh, started uh, shortly after that um, and a uh, fairly successful um, end of, and straightforward uh, in fairness, um, endovascular repair. Uh, but that happened uh, because we were able to communicate quickly uh, to our theatre team, to our radiographer, uh, to our anaesthetist, um, that this uh, case was, uh, was on the way in. Um, now, to finish, I'm going to give you my pearls of wisdom as far as um, uh, EVAR is concerned in rupture. I'd say that um, oversizing is important. It's different to planning uh, an elective uh, repair. And I think we, the oversizing needs to be that little bit more. Uh, so 20 to 30%, I'd suggest. Um, access to a decent consignment, uh, both in terms of uh, standard endovascular consumables, uh, but also to, to endografts um, is important so that you have options. Um, Experience is important, and I think that you need a friend, ideally two. Um, in an ideal world, I think two operators and a, and, and a wingman uh, loose uh, observing the procedure, uh, advising, getting uh, additional bits of kit. I think it, it makes a massive difference in these really high pressure um, situations. Um, I would always go percutaneous um, for a rupture, um, with the difference being uh, I would not pre-close if they were unstable. I'd go straight for sheath access. If they're stable, I think uh, you're perfectly entitled uh, to, uh, to do it like an elective repair, pre-close uh, and proceed uh, in a steady way. Uh, and obviously, if the patient is unstable, um, it, the consideration of uh, aortic occlusion is important uh, and, and important to do that early uh, if, um, if that's a worry. My top tip, I'd suggest, from an endovascular standpoint, is to put in a sheath. Uh, because the thing that the patients don't like, um, even under, even with a local anaesthetic, um, is the is the sheaths moving in and out. Uh, so if you put your device, if you if you put your big sheaths in, uh, that's done. Uh, they then relax and often will have fallen asleep uh, by the time you get round to uh, to finishing uh, the procedure. Uh, particularly if you have a friendly anaesthetist who who, who, who understands. Uh, that th there is going to be some agitation uh, towards the end of these types of cases uh, because of uh, lower limb ischemia, uh, uh, hypotension, uh, etc. Uh, but the, the main thing, I think, is getting your sheaths in um, early, uh, which also means that if you do need a, 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 a long sheath up for, um, for an aortic occlusion balloon, uh, it's simple. Um, do give heparin. Um, not straight away, um, but, uh, but um, uh, certainly if you're going to put an occlusion balloon up, think about heparin a little bit earlier than you would otherwise. Um, and I would put in the heparin, uh, some heparin, so uh, a smaller dose of three, 4,000 units of heparin uh, after the, um, the main body um, is in. And the final point I'd say is to keep your procedure simple. Do what you would do in an elective repair, uh, and don't don't be don't try and be uh, too clever about it. Uh, I think I'm on time, uh, so I'll stop there and say thank you very much, Celia. Uh, Simon, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, you you sort of described an almost perfect rupture scenario.
uh, whereby a really complex case comes in and uh, is faced with an experienced team that is able to handle you know, anything open or endovascular. I saw two right renal arteries, an ugly posterior bulge and a rooftop incision. So I'm assuming that uh, uh, you went for a uh, sort of type four approach. Um, and you also shared, you know, what happens when you have an experienced endovascular team that is able to, to, to handle a difficult uh, rupture. We had um, one question from uh, the audience, uh, a vascular surgeon from Ethiopia that said that your first patient would certainly die in their country because there are only two vascular surgeons for 11 million people. Uh, my gut reaction to this would be you either introduce a screening program so that your two vascular surgeons become very busy in their elective practice and prevent ruptures, or you try and teach general surgeons how to safely, uh, keeping it simple, as you say, perform uh, a, a standard infrarenal rupture. Any comments on that? What happens when there is no appropriate infrastructure? Because we certainly see uh, outcomes differ widely, uh, depending on what time of day a patient presents, depending on which team is available. Uh, and certainly at Mary's, uh, most people that present with a rupture out of hours get an open repair, actually. Um, any comments? Any comments from the panel members, Paul? Baron has his hand up. Sorry, Baron. Mm. Thank you, Celia. Simon, um, thank you very much for this nice um, strategic talk. You, um, you advised to have two experienced operators. Uh, how do you manage to keep them uh, experienced and trained experienced? And, and how is your on-call schedule then for these uh, uh, kind of uh, emergencies? Do you have a shadow uh, roster um, or an endo shadow versus an open uh, um, experienced operator? Uh, so we're, we're lucky in that uh, all, tw all 12 of our vascular surgeons are uh, endovascular capable uh, and, and can do an EVA. Um, we have uh, a number of experienced registrars we have uh, on the surgical side. Um, we're lucky that we also have a really high pedigree of, uh, of uh, vascular radiology uh, in our unit. Uh, so if there isn't another surgeon available, there is a radiologist, uh, either a consultant or a senior fellow. Um, there generally tends to be somebody else available, with, but we have no formal um, uh, setup for calling in a second person. Um, if the if the radiologist on call uh, is an endovascular specialist, that's that's generally uh, your uh, your port of call. Um, but we have a we have a handful of our uh, interventional radiology uh, team who who, are, who don't do elective vascular work, uh, so we would not use them. We would call in um, call in a friend uh, effectively. And, and looking at your slides, you also are calling in. Special assistance. I mean, I think this is scrub nurses for endovascular cases. So, how does this work in the? So not, not, the theater nurses are not experienced in EVAR. So uh, there's this, the 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 we 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 um, it's probably good. Well, it's good planning. Uh, our emergency theater unit um, are shared with the vascular surgery unit. So uh, it's I can't take credit for that. That's um, that's a. a, a a hospital policy um, uh, that we share our team with the emergency theatre team, uh, which means that most of the time there is somebody on call uh, who works on the regular uh, hybrid um, vascular uh, 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 rotor. Uh, so there's usually at least one, if not two, uh, other nurses or operating department uh, practitioners um, who are experienced in, in that environment. So we, it's, it's, one of the, it's one of those things that you've, you've got to be sensitive about uh, in that it is possible that you'll have a team that's not uh, capable of helping you with your endovascular case and that may sway you towards doing uh, an open repair. Um, but there are telephones and we can always call people in uh, should the need arise. And I, I, I'd, I'd encourage um, uh, 
people to call in help um, when, when needed for, for cases like this. Thank you, Simon. Now there's, I've got another question that's coming on the question answer talking about um, when you should consider not operating on patients, because obviously your drive for your getting patients through the system, you know, is really drive towards getting people through quickly. And we understand why that is. Where does the sense check come in your system about whether you're really operating on the right people and operating, you know, and not putting people who shouldn't be moved and should be yeah. looked after an end of life in an appropriate way? Very difficult sometimes. And sometimes you've got to bring them to make that assessment. Um, but it's, I think it, it's why it takes that 15, 20, that phone call takes a little bit longer than, um, uh, than uh, you'd imagine. Uh, and I think it's generally the surgeon feeling out the referring physician um, to get an idea of um, appropriateness uh, for, for surgery. So age, I'd suggest, is probably not the best discriminator, particularly um, in the realms of endovascular surgery. Um, but uh, there will be there will be signs of frailty um, that should steer you away from uh, putting people through uh, this type of surgery. So uh, uh, cognitive impairment, um, frailty, uh, and severe medical comorbidity, um, I'd suggest are the three things that um, uh, are immediate alarm bells and would uh, steer you towards a conservative approach. So. We, 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 we estimate about 20% uh, uh, of our referrals are turned down uh, for ruptured um, uh, AAAs uh, in our unit. Excellent. Um, so we had a, a bit of an issue with the first poll and I understand that people couldn't see the, uh, the results of the poll that went up on the screen, but the answer was that by far the majority of people felt that uh, you should be doing ruptures only if you're doing elective uh, repair. Uh, as well, which you know fits with what we what we said before. Um, so we'd like to move on to another question just before Andrew does his talk, if that's all right. Uh, talking really, Simon, you know, coming from what you've said as well, looking at uh, the uh, the time really from door to definitive management. Uh, so if Jenny, you're able to launch the next poll. There you go. So, vascular end of, oh no, that's the same one again. Question number two, here we go. Question number two, there we go. The time from arrival at the, at the front door to definitive operative management should be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes or 90 minutes. And we accept that what sometimes what we'd like to achieve and what we're able to achieve may uh, may be slightly different. <laughs> there, there, and there, there is another nuance there, uh, Paul, which is it depends a little bit on which hospital they turn up at because we, we cover um, a big patch, as do you. Same, same as us, yeah. If you're in Western Supermare, if you survive the transfer, you know, that's a really positive sign that you're actually probably stable enough and are likely to do well perversely than the the wobbly patient that comes through the main door in north bristol yeah I mean, it's 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 better for you for the surgeon's figures isn't it but um overall <laughs> um, it's not brilliant excellent so the majority of people there have said an hour which i think you know would i think it's probably got a mix of pragmatism and uh and, you know, and what we'd like to achieve in there as well. So thank you, everyone. Um, Andrew, I'd like to invite you to give your talk now. Um, thank you very much to uh, Patrick and to BSET for the uh, invitation to come speak to you all. And thank you. Um, to the chairs and thank you Simon for such a great talk. Um, this is kind of our webinar COVID life at the moment. Um, and uh, but there is some real educational value in what we're doing. Um, and so we should persist until we can see each other again. 
Um, these are my social media handles for those who are active on them. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, the management of abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture. And really, there is so, so very much to talk about. Um, and hopefully, uh, as a group of speakers, we are, we'll be able to sort of touch on a few of all of these kind of things. But there's things like teamwork, which is critical to this kind of thing. Team training with or without simulators, the decision making that people uh, employ for either an endovascular or an open approach and the data for each modality. There's the technical aspects of the procedures themselves. What do you do in a complex abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture? And then there's also post-op care, in particular, sometimes the management of compartment syndrome that can follow such repairs. Um, but what I'd like to focus on today is really the context of your local health ecosystem and how that is uh, paramount in how one goes on to develop your own ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm algorithm. One size absolutely doesn't fit all. And this has already been touched upon by our colleagues from Ethiopia who are covering 11 million people. However, it is BSET after all. Um, and two or three things I'd like to also focus on is early ultrasound guided femoral arterial sheath access under local endovascular aortic occlusion and a few advances as endovascular technique and kit that one can consider. So Simon uh, mentioned this, um, and I really enjoy the bathtub analogy when it comes to the abdominal aortic rupture. You have got to turn off the tap, and then you've got to go and plug and repair the hole. Um, and, you know, if only our job was this easy, and sadly it's not, it can be very complicated. The decision-making complicated, the teamwork is complicated, um, and the repairs can often be challenging and difficult and stressful. I am just old enough to remember a pre-endovascular era, and uh, there are, and there still is some historical teaching about the no CT scan, straight to theater, midline laparotomy with digital control, neck dissection and the cross clamp, and then you stick on your eye neck clamps and you get on with the repair. Here are some wooden spoons for those of you who uh, remember these. Uh, is the aortic sort of compression device. And right in the middle there is literally a wooden spoon which is scalloped out, which you can compress the aorta against the spinous processes. Um, an exceptionally useful device, which I've seen employed to great effect many times. But what's changed? Well, all units around the world um, have virtually ubiquitous access to high resolution CT scanning. And then there's obviously the endovascular revolution and therefore the ruptured EVA. Hybrid operating theatres have changed very much how we all practice. There is the concept of ROBOA. But how do these things translate into a practical algorithm for the management of the abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture? Um, and really, the context is key and everything really comes from there. And I'd just like to touch upon a little bit about Singapore, really, um, and how it can significantly differ from country to country and place to place in terms of what people can achieve and can do. Singapore is affectionately known as the little red dot. And it's tiny. It's smaller than London. It's got a population of about five and a half million. There are two national heart centers, seven vascular units in total, all aortic capable. And you can drive from one end of Singapore to the other in an hour and walk it in a day. This is where I work. This is the National University Heart Centre in Singapore. It's a 1400 bedded tertiary referrals centre hospital. And this is our hybrid operating theatre. Um, it was opened in 2011. We've got 10 years experience really of our whole team, scrub nurses, anaesthetists, ODAs, vascular surgeons, cardiovascular surgeons, cardiac surgeons working in a hybrid theatre environment. And we're fortunate to be in an exceptionally well-resourced healthcare system with early access to almost all endovascular technology. Um, fortunately for us, we're also part of a department that includes cardiac surgery, 
We provide the full range of our cardiovascular sort of surgical procedures, um, including ECMO and cardiopulmonary bypass. So in terms of uh, Mr. Nikwe's pearls, um, I'd like to sort of refer to these as my own. You know, what we can do or what we do is really what we are allowed to do um, and what our resourcing allows us to do uh, and what our equipment allows us to do and what our staffing allows us to do. And so whilst we don't have as formalized a protocol as uh, Liverpool do, um, we echo many of uh, the very important points that Simon made. Immediate CT scanning um, in the emergency department um, is obviously paramount. And we have a system of uh, triage for patients in theatre. And an abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture uh, falls into the same category as an emergency trauma patient, which means that they have the capacity and we have the staff and the ability to take them straight to our hybrid operating theatre. Um, we touched upon this earlier in Simon's talk, and I'd like to talk about it just a little bit more, but the concept of getting femoral sheath access under ultrasound, under local anaesthetic, whilst the patient is awake is, is key. Um, and for me, this doesn't really, it doesn't really matter whether you're planning to do an endovascular operation or an open operation. Femoral sheath access uh, will give you uh, benefits for both. Coda or a similar aortic occlusion balloon in the descending thoracic aorta, always screened as you're going up. And then if the patient does become unstable, you have the opportunity to balloon inflate again under fluoro if needed, followed by immediate anesthetic induction if you're doing it open. And you need to just remind yourself to start the clock. Um, you don't have to put yourself under undue pressure, um, but it is just a reminder that you are in the descending thoracic aorta and you're obviously above the viscerals. And then you do an open repair or a ruptured EVAR, depending on anatomy, surgeon experience, or what uh, the team feel comfortable doing. Ultrasound guided retrograde femoral sheath axis. Um, it's exceptionally well tolerated under local. There's very little physiological disturbance. And the benefits of it are really, it's rapid, it's easily taught, and maybe most importantly, it's easily performed by junior members of the team. And it's something that people can do uh, that will assist in the future uh, progression of the operation, be it a ruptured aneurysm by EVA or by OPEN, um, whilst you are waiting to have these communications with the family members, to have communications with your team whilst you are going through the scans and trying to decide what to do and trying to pick um, things off the shelf. And then you've got this concept of aortic balloon control. Now, I don't really enjoy the term resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta, um, but, you know, it's what we've got now, endoclamping. Um, the important thing is it buys time. It doesn't buy too much. You do need to make some progress within your operation once you've inflated the balloon. But what it does allow you to do is it allows one to play catch up. It allows you to stabilize unstable hemodynamics and used appropriately with people that do it regularly. It can be an exceptionally useful tool. This is the balloon that we're probably most familiar with, the coda. Um, it's, as Simon did say, it requires a long sheath. Most of the time it's a large sheath, 14 French. I think the important thing to realize is that it is semi-compliant polyurethane balloon. Don't overinflate it. It does go up to 40 millimeters. You can rupture a normal aorta if you are up in the descending thoracic and should try and do this always under screening and guidance. But we're making progress. So from our trauma colleagues, we now have these very compliant Reboa balloons, which can be deployed and they have been uh, uh, used without fluoroscopy as well. Um, and these may play a role in our future algorithms and our practice. 
Brenda and I actually wrote this paper a few a couple of years ago now. Um, but we and in my own peripheral practice, at least, we've started employing uh, radial artery access for a number of different reasons, but particularly because of the significant decrease in femoral arterial complications um, that we found in the literature. And interestingly, the new endovascular kit and the new endovascular technology um, may well allow us to provide a suitable and robust aortic occlusion from a radial artery. And this may uh, significantly help um, how we manage our patients in the future. Um, I'm not particularly shouting out one company over another, but those who are familiar with um, the BD Halo One sheath now know that they are at least one size French short, uh, smaller than their counterparts and their colleagues. Um, and that allows you to deliver six and seven French devices from a radial artery. You've also got this Tokai occlusion balloon catheter, which is specifically designed for such a purpose. It's long, it's highly compliant. Um, it can easily reach your descending thoracic aorta where you need it to. And again, it may be something that we start using very much in the future. In summary, and I've been very conscious of the time, uh, your own ecosystem will dictate how best you manage your ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms. I would suggest for those that can, early ultrasound guided femoral sheath placement under local can play an important role in one's algorithm. Aortic occlusion is very much in our armamentarium. And um, I just want to say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Andrew. Fantastic talk, and you addressed um, a number of questions from the audience on um, uh, selective or non-selective balloon occlusion as well as access, and I'm glad that you brought up the sort of radial access option. Um, one of the questions from the audience relates to, to timing, and obviously timing is of the essence. Isabel uh, Van Herzl has raised an important question that it all depends on how stable the patient is um, uh, when the clock starts. But what would you consider as the definitive operative management? Um, and that's a question for both um, Andrew and Simon. Is it uh, time to uh, knife to skin? Is it sheath access? Is it clamp on or is it balloon on or actually a, a complete aortic repair? Thanks, Celia. I think that's an excellent question. I think for me, um, really using that bathtub analogy again, you've got, you know, blood pouring through a hole, be it contained or not. And really, I think the definitive time where you can just stop and take stock of where you are in terms of an operation, be it rebar or open, is really either when a balloon is up or when the clamp is on. Until you've done that, you've still got an unstable patient who's potentially still exsanguinating. And it really has to be one of those two uh, metrics, either the balloon up, um, and there are a number of endovascular ways to do that, um, and a number of different techniques described, which I'm sure other people will touch upon. But for me, that would be the definitive time. So balloon up or cross clamp on. Thank you. Do you have a way, Andrew, you know, obviously timing being important, how do you, how do you keep tabs on the time? Because I find that it just disappears. No, absolutely. And, and, and that, is, that, that is probably something that we could probably learn from those patients who run um, resuscitation calls. You know, you have somebody there as part of your team who's there timing when you've done CPR, when you've given adrenaline and, you know, time of diagnosis to time to theatre. Somebody needs to be keeping an eye on that. And you're absolutely right. You can get very lost uh, in uh, trying to organise, communicate, get the relevant kit and you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Time does run away for you. So you just need to go by the patient essentially um, and I think that's probably your best metric for how uh, rapidly you need to act um, and whether you need to put a balloon up or not, for example. Thank you. Simon, you have a question or comment? I think that that um, problem with tunnel vision uh, is where having an, a, another body in the room makes a huge difference. It's a, an experienced colleague 
uh, just hanging around, just keeping an eye on you, uh, making sure that you, you haven't become uh, uh, goal uh, goal obsessed. You, you, you're not spending half an hour trying to cannulate um, a contralateral gait. It, it, somebody to tell you, right, stop, <laughs> move on, uh, which can be very difficult. And I think um, uh, that's the reason to have two um, operate, experienced operators, particularly for EVAR. Um, and if you can have somebody uh, standing off, um, even better. So, I mean, interesting, we've taken the approach at times of saying, right, you run the room, you lead the operation as yeah. a sort of strategy to do it. Yeah. Great. So I'm conscious of time. Uh, save your questions for the end. We'll have a little bit more time, hopefully. Uh, I would like to uh, first see the next poll question, please, Jeanette, before we move on to the next talk. So I hope you can all see this. The approach to ruptured AAA care in my vascular unit is best described as a team policy open first, team policy EVA first, surgeon dependent on whether open or EVA, ruptured EVA first, but open repair if anatomy is unsuitable, controversial, open first, but rupture if patient is less fit, sensible. Does it matter what time of day it is, Celia? Well, uh, that was going to be my first comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have um, we have the results. So forty five percent, Eva first, but open if the anatomy is unsuitable. Closely followed by surgeon dependent on what they're comfortable with. That's great. I hope you could all see this. Uh, I agree that it really depends on, on time of day and general infrastructure. Um, Shireen, I would like to introduce you and uh, welcome you to the virtual podium. What's, what's your view? What's the approach in your unit? Or uh, we actually, it is EVAR first. Sorry, I'm gonna stop sharing here for a second. Uh, so our approach is endovascular first if it's anatomically suitable and otherwise open repair. Uh, we do, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I will echo a lot of things that Simon and Andy, uh, Andrew said, and I'll show that in my slides as well. Uh, we do call a friend when needed. That is definitely if the repair seems to be complex and not an apple and a stick type situation. Uh, that we do have a semi-formal system for that where somebody's always available to be to lend a hand. Uh, and I think that's very important to be comfortable calling in your colleagues uh, to get the patient out of trouble. Wonderful. Thank you. Shereen, over to you. Thank you. Yeah. And the slides are up, yes? Yes, all great. great. Fantastic. Uh, so I like a lot of the things that have already been said, uh, but we'll give you the Seattle experience. And truly, it's just a matter of highlighting again, how do you adapt uh, to your own environment? And uh, so again, greetings from Seattle. So we have two major teaching hospitals as part of the University of Washington uh, system. Uh, where I work primarily is the University of Washington Medical Center. This is where our cardiac surgery team resides. And then the other hospital is Harborview Medical Center, which is the county hospital and where the major trauma goes. And this is where our ruptures go. Uh, it makes sense uh, to place the program there where we are also active for trauma uh, for this patient population. The, the unique uh, arrangement for the University of Washington is that we cover a four state region in the United States. So that's about uh, a quarter of the mass of the United States. So while the population density is not very high, you can see that there are, will be long transfer times uh, in order to reach uh, definitive repair. And so we rely also on airlift Northwest and have to bring people in by chopper. Uh, so that also flavors our approach to uh, ruptured aneurysms. 
uh, the protocol was started uh, a long time ago in 2007 uh, when Dr. Stearns came, uh, came over and took over the program. And what he did at that time is organize this protocol approach, which you have heard about a lot of uh, hospitals do this in this day and age. Uh, and it centers again on the pre-hospital communication. Uh, but one of the important tenants was the permissive hypotension for the patients. As long as they are mentating, uh, we do not intubate them. Uh, and we allow them to be hypotensive, we're usually in the 80s. Uh, the role of intubation, again, that's done only as a last resort. Uh, we warm the patient. And obviously, now we have the capacity to transfer images. So frequently, we will have the imaging ahead of time. So we are prepared for the patient. In the hospital itself, uh, I'll show you a picture, but we have a rupture ready OR. This is an OR on standby and always available for ruptures. We keep a large inventory on hand. Uh, again, communication with the anesthesia team and then subsequent ICU care. And the organization alone makes a difference in terms of the outcomes. And you can see, uh, and this has been published uh, previously, but pre-protocol, the mortality was 60%. Post-protocol, the survival improved both for open and for endovascular uh, repair. So organization uh, cannot be overestimated in this circumstance. We also have published guidelines for how to transport these patients in our, in our center. Uh, we have a centralized transfer center where the physicians will call. Uh, we obviously ask them to start two large bore IVs and allow, again, the permissive hypotension I mentioned and warming the patient, uh, and then uh, have them transferred. Uh, this is our operating room. Uh, I am old enough also to remember doing ruptures with a C-arm, and now we have moved on to hybrid uh, rooms. Uh, but as you can see on the table are all the, uh, the wires and catheters, and basically the balloon uh, occlusion kit is available, so that it is readily available. And even if you don't have a nurse who has ever done an EVAR before, we've also learned to simplify our language by referring to wires with colors sometimes rather than the names of them, so they may not know what a Benson wire is, but they certainly can figure out the green wire or the black wire. Uh, and so that helps the, the simplify the communications to kind of move things along when things are stressful. Uh, this is a historical uh, picture of an aortic occlusion balloon under a C-arm, uh, but the same idea is that this is used uh, if we need it. Uh, the other thing that has evolved in our practice is the idea of using a preoperative risk score to predict mortality. This is quite relevant for our system again, uh, and maybe applicable to other systems as well. Again, we are getting people from far away. And, and so when we looked back at our uh, population, we found that there are four predictors, uh, you know, the wind combined together, elevate the risk score and are associated with mortality. And those are age over 76, creatinine greater than two, systolic blood pressure less than 70 and a pH of 7.2. And uh, there was a question earlier about when do you say that this is going to be a futile effort or perhaps not transfer the patient. And so we actually factor these four score numbers when we talk to the referring physician, depending on how far they are. Uh, and certainly if the patient's having active CPR in Alaska, uh, then the mortality will, you know, be, uh, you know, guaranteed. And so we, we will ask them at this point to really have a conversation with the family before, you know, sending the patient many, many miles over. Uh, so I will highlight two cases, sort of flavors of what comes through uh, the door and what we would see. And predominantly in these cases, uh, they both involved large iliac artery aneurysms. Uh, so here is a 72-year-old man who was playing cards with his brother and had sudden loss of consciousness. Uh, he presented to an outside ER south of uh, where we are uh, at uh, 930. Uh, and under, with a hypotensive with a blood pressure of 84. They did get him into the scanner uh, to their credit. And uh, let me put this here. I'm just gonna move you out of the way. Uh, right, so you can see it was a non-contrast CT scan, but they were not suspicious of a rupture, but you can see he had a free rupture with a large iliac artery aneurysm and a small abdominal aortic aneurysm. And so, of course, they called and activated the transfer protocol. And you can see we airlifted him via chopper, and we were in the OR at 3.30 in the morning. So this was the, you know, the transfer time. The other thing we've implemented is we have through the door to the OR directly. So we do not, st we stop in the ER long enough to only get a wristband with the 
ID and then directly go to the OR. So bypass the ER entirely, no blood draws in the, in the ER, no messing around, no time. Just get to the OR, move them to the table and do what we need to do. Simon's point about the arm, the right arm being out and being the anesthesia arm, we definitely don't wait for them to start their A-line. They can do this stuff while we are prepping the groins and we definitely do not intubate. And this is an example of what we did with this gentleman. And what was interesting about his anatomy is that his tear, his rupture was at the bottom end, if you will, of his large uh, iliac artery aneurysm. And so uh, we were able to see this. He had a non-contrast CT, so it was difficult to see that, of course, a priority. And we were able to get the wires up and take a picture and find this and quickly embolize this internal iliac artery. And as soon as this is done, to, to use uh, Andrew's analogy, we've plugged the hole and uh, things leveled out for this patient and we were able to then perform uh, the EVAR uh, and get that up and over in place and uh, seal, you know, complete the repair. He did require a couple units of blood to be transfused at that time, sent up after that to the ICU, and he was discharged 36 hours later. Uh, so again, this, this is an example of when the team is lined up and we have everything working perfectly. This is how, uh, you know, in an ideal work it looks. Uh, case two is another gentleman, also 74. Uh, he, in this circumstance, has a prior EVAR history and came in with nausea and vomiting. And then also while he was in the ER, said, oh, I've also been having abdominal pain. Uh, so got a CT scan and you can see here um, what his anatomy looks like. So the ER team was not suspecting this picture, uh, but clearly has a free rupture. And you can see that he has an iliac limb separation here. And uh, on this axial view, you can see that. So again, we mobilized the OR team. In this circumstance, we had the luxury that he had his operation done in our system. Uh, this was a three-dimensional reconstruction of his aorta. And here's a CT from prior. And again, he had this large iliac aneurysm and an abdominal aneurysm. And this was the three-dimensional reconstruction of what his EVAR looked like at one point before the limbs moved and separated. In this case, the repair was quite uh, simple, really, in terms of the plugging the hole is just by putting in a limb to span uh, the, the area uh, of the component separation. And uh, the difference between this case and the other case is that it took a little bit longer to figure out what he had. So he had lost quite a bit more blood. Uh, so he was in the hospital for three days instead of 36 hours. And uh, this is our team. And this is the idea of, again, calling a friend. We have a large team. And so we're able to have that luxury in our system. So that does make a difference. And I'd love to open it for discussion and see how uh, you handle uh, similar cases. Shireen, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation and fantastic infrastructure. Uh, thank you for sharing this uh, with us. I really liked your idea of color coding for, for wires and devices. And that's certainly something I do for my trainees. And especially in, in the context of a rupture, there's no point showing off your in-depth endovascular uh, kit uh, knowledge, but making it simple for the team to, to save the patient's life. Um, th there's a lot of uh, questions from the audience about um, diagnosis and decision making in the spoke sites and specifically uh, people are asking where should you have a CT? Would you insist that the CT is performed and therefore the diagnosis is made before the patient reaches you or would you prefer you get the patient there as soon as possible and you assess and diagnose on site? Question number one. And question number two, and uh, this has come from Rachel Bell uh, as, as well as a few other people. Some, some of the spoke uh, sites are uncomfortable making the decision. Think about comorbidities, think about demented patients. Who should be making that decision and how in terms of treatment versus no treatment? These are fantastic questions. So what I would say in the reality, the majority of people would have had a CT scan before we got the call. Uh, you know, and, and you can see both those patients had CT scans first, then they were diagnosed, and then, you know, we received the call. Uh, you know, there is a, perhaps the rare occasion, I, I, and I can't think of a circumstance where this happened, where somebody has maybe uh, fast exams and they were able to look with ultrasound and see that this is a ruptured aorta, but they will still have to call you and initiate the transfer, which takes time. So CT scans, if they're readily available, I prefer if we can get one, if it doesn't delay the transfer. Uh, because it also gives us the luxury while the patient is en route to quickly measure. 
uh, and and prepare and have the room ready and 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 it's you're also you're in the right headspace in terms of this is my game plan here's what we're doing and you've debriefed your team so everybody's ready to go it's like here's the plan uh, in terms of the decision making I think the onus falls on us you know when we receive this call to support the calling physician who is calling us and saying you know I have this rupture and and so this is the time to say okay what are the labs what are the vitals what is the circumstance is this patient do they have advanced wills do they have directives and, and to really walk through that uh, frequently you know not frequently I would say but occasionally you can get somebody who's panicked on the other line and it really it's your job to to calm them down and and again this is an emergency type situation however you know the best outcome for the patient comes when we are all calm and, and having a discussion about what the right thing to do. Great, thank you. Shireen, can I just ask you a question? So we, we've talked a lot about patients coming into the hospital, but what do you do about monitoring patients afterwards with an endovascular first approach? How do you manage potential abdominal compartment syndrome, those sort of problems? Oh, that, that's a great question. So at the end of the case, obviously, we need to examine the abdomen and see if it's quite distended or if there's any evidence of hemodynamic compromise related to that. Uh, I mean, the two components is you have to make sure that you, you've sealed the hole and that there's no endo leaks, right? Because if they remain unstable, then either they're bleeding or they have compartment syndrome, right? I think you would expect their vitals to level out once you've had the repair. Uh, and obviously, we do a completion angiogram at the end to make sure there's no endo leak. Uh, in the absence of endo leak, the next differential is that they have compartment syndrome. You have a Foley catheter in place. You measure compartment. You know you can measure interbladder pressure. Examine the patient if the abdomen is distended, and if there's any concern that there's compartment syndrome, then you would open the abdomen. Uh, we do not drain the retroperitoneal hematoma, so this is very important. So just open the abdomen, decompress it, let the bowels, uh, you know, have room, uh, and then put a primary, you know, a uh, temporary closure and get them up. Uh, we've used the the Aptera, which is like the wound vac equivalent, uh, but we've also done, you know, the poor man's uh, closures with, you know, JP drains and the wall suction as well. So, I mean, any of these things would work. The key is just to protect mm -hmm. the bowels, uh, you know, with, with usually a bag, some sort of bowel bag. Yeah. Do you have a formal protocol for that or is it really done on suspicion? Uh, I mean, In we all check. Yeah, I mean, we all check, right? It's part of the things that we check for at the end of the case. And when they're in the intensive care unit, that's still on the differential. Like if they are not hemodynamically normalized, we, you have to think about this. Okay. Uh, so th there's a question for you specifically. Um, now, talk about the concept of oversizing uh, in rupture. You know, with your special area of interest in connective tissue disease, how, how do you play that game, you know, balancing between the two? So, so, so here's the happy news is that uh, at least most of the patients with connective tissue disease will present with thoracic aortic ruptures, not abdominal aortic ruptures in general. Uh, and so for the thoracic aortic ruptures, I minimally oversize. Uh, and, and I base that on IVUS, but you do have to factor in the fact that they can be hypotensive. For the abdominal aorta, what I have seen, uh, you know, if you suspect it, I would say try to, again, 10 to 15% and not oversize. But, you know, the... That's a very rare type scenario, if you will. Uh, the recent ones I know about, and I've not operated on them, but I know about them. One was a young gentleman that required an open repair anyways in his 40s. Uh, the other one had a dissection associated, infrarenal abnormal aortic dissection. Uh, so, and this person also needed an open repair. Uh, so then really a lot of the circumstances with their anatomy uh, are things that are amenable to open repair. Uh, and that's a whole other discussion, but, you know, we use felt, you know, gentle clamping, uh, felt buttressing of your anastomosis, uh, and then the, the open, you know, uh, repair principles, you know, you just get in, get out, you know, don't spend a lot of time, don't get too smart, fix the problem and get out. Excellent. Thank you very much. Oh, Simon's got his hand up. Simon. Shireen, I'm really jealous of this concept of the uh, rupture ready OR. Can you tell us uh, what, the, what, what that means? How, how do you set up for that? 
Uh, so this is the main OR for the vascular team at the Harbor, at Harborview Medical Center. So during the daytime, there are elective cases in that room, but at nighttime, it is dedicated to ruptured aortas. So no traumas go into that room. Nobody else uses that room. And certainly if I have a acute limb ischemia or if I have some, you know, forearm problem or something like that, I will not put them in that room. I will take another room and then still maintain the structure ready room because really you want the patient to land on the stretcher into the room right away and not have delays. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so what we'd like to do now is just put up uh, our ne next poll, if that's possible, please. Just before uh, Baron comes up. So question, the approach to ruptured AAA care in my vascular unit is best described as, no, we've had that one. Let's go for the next one. There you go. In a patient with a 10 millimeter infrarenal neck, it's good to know I'm paying attention. Uh, I would offer standard uh, ruptured EVAR. I would offer ruptured EVAR with endo anchors, open repair or chimneys. You can see that the, the influence from the United States is relatively low with the chimney numbers remaining relatively low there. So let's stop that there and so most people saying open repair, closely followed by uh, standard ruptured EVAR and some people putting in endo anchors, which I think, again, serves to highlight the, uh, the general difficulties of the sort of, as it gets to slightly closer to on off label and questions about durability that we have to think about. So uh, finally, oh, Shireen, you put your hand up, yes. I do. It was not on there. Who would use the um, a device that's approved for the short 10 millimeter neck? Would anybody consider that at this day and age? Okay, Paul, you would. <laughs> I mean, that's also another option. You know, again, the, the point is you're trying to get the person out of trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, if there are problems later, sometimes, you know, you accept that you have to deal with that. And we know that EVAR in rupture cases does require further reintervention more than your elective cases. Mm -hmm. There is an argument to sort of temporize and get out and, and come back when the patient is stable. Sure. I'd like to comment uh, specifically on the chimney option. Uh, and I would, I would really stay clear of doing uh, anything like that for, for a rupture because you, you need it to be quick. Um, and you may sacrifice a kidney um to, to to get them off the table alive but um I, I would go i would i would go for a seal uh straight away um and accept that i may i may compromise arenal artery or two um and may need to come in uh, secondarily and rescue those uh but your aim is to save that person's life um, and spending two hours and an additional two hours uh, putting in chimneys um is generally not your best move um, and well, you may be better off using your endovascular control uh, going for an open repair if that's the situation uh, or you may accept a compromise EVA, uh, a seal on the day and then worry about um, uh, long-term uh, stability. Well, Simon, I, I, I would like to comment shortly. I mean, if, if you put in the main graft and, and um, go over that renal for a bit or maybe a bit too much and you have got your seal then it's not a very uh, big deal to take a steerable sheet and then put in a so-called rescue chimney i mean yes. it's, it's a different uh, strategy than going for a pre-planned chimney evar from above uh, i wouldn't be opposed to the first example personally yes no i'd agree i'd agree excellent baron i'd very much like to invite you up to the virtual podium now for uh... Your talk, you seem to, you've escaped the uh, potential complex uh, repair you've, you might have had to do today or at this time. 
Well, it, it, I, I did. It was a rather sad story because the patient didn't reach our hospital. Um, uh, but that was a, um, a thoracoabdominal problem. So we're, we will be um, looking at uh, the infrarenal side today. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, friends from DSET, for this invitation. I have no uh, conflicts of interest. Um, I work in Maastricht. Uh, we call ourselves an aortic center, but this is not a protected term in the world. Um, we have a 50-50 caseload of infrarenal or juxtarenal triple A's versus more complex, which is a bit odd for uh, regular centers, I think. Um, we only cover locally um, infrarenal uh, aneurysms, which makes that we only see an average of 10 ruptures a year. Uh, but we also get 10 uh, ruptures or symptomatic um, more complex aneurysms a year because of the regional or supra-regional uh, coverage for thoracoabdominal aneurysms. And sometimes we get patients from other countries, specifically if they have connective tissue disease and need an extensive open repair. Um, so, um, I would like to present you a case, a case from last year. It's a 69-year-old male. He was referred or he came in with acute back pain since four hours um, and the GP thought it may have been some musculoskeletal. So, there was some delay there. He was normally responsive, but uh, was seen quite soon to be pale and sweaty and hypotensive. Uh, and then um, was um, seen with more urgency than normally. He had a powerful pulsating mass in the abdomen. His history was um, a typical vascular history, um, and this is his meds. He didn't have any allergies. So he got uh, two large bore venous excess. There were bloods taken. We have a permissive hypertension protocol, as was earlier um, described. And then um, the vascular surgeon was called. Uh, because he came in by walk, sort of walking, we were not informed beforehand. Uh, theater is being called and ICU is being called. That's the algorithm. Um, and we have the same situation as Shireen with a hybrid theater readily available for our unit at all times. So um, either you have to stop your operation or go to another theater or it's free. Um, we have a CT scanner in the ED and this is the CT scan that was um, done and you will appreciate um, that there is a venous contrast there in an arterial face and this is uh, two more views So this led us to the diagnosis of a ruptured AAA, um, mainly a ruptured common iliac artery uh, on the left with an AV fistula at the iliac level. So um, what are important features now for decision making? Uh, this is OR versus EVAR, uh, which approach or strategy for OR, which uh, open repair, I mean, which approach or strategy for an EVAR. Well, there's some patient features for decision-making. Uh, it's a relatively young male. He has no major comorbidities. He's hypertensive, but well-responsive. He's got an HB of six, which is a little bit below normal, and a G EGFR of 50. Anatomical features for decision-making in this case are the normal size of the aorta. It's a large aneurysm of the common iliac artery. There's a large AV fistula. The, the, the internal iliac artery is patent and he's got suitable femoral axis. So our thoughts or thoughts for open repair, um, I, I will just go through it instead of making it interactive, is that, I mean, one could expect massive bleeding from a fistula like that. Uh, usually these fistulas are closed from the inside, so from the aortic side under manual compression of the, of the vein. Um, uh, nowadays they get more recognized before and of course with a CT scan compared to in the early days. Um, you may encounter difficult control of a uh, hypergastric in such a large aneurysm and be prepared to have balloon catheters ready, I think. Eve, our thoughts on this side is what to do with the left hypergastric. 
uh, it's quite tortuous on the left side with a large aneurysm. So where do you go with your main device? How do you expect cannulation? And what to do with the fistula? So I think the patient is suitable for open repair and EVAR, and the anatomy is suitable for open repair and EVAR. And we have an EVAR first under local anesthesia policy. So that's what we've done. We did local anesthesia, um, bilateral guided puncture, uh, two prognites each side and nine, nine French sheets and crossover from the right into the left where we put a plug in the uh, hypogastric first. Then we gave heparin uh, to this discussion point, uh, put, in, sorry, put in the main device um, and through the left choose uh, with a cook graft, um, right extension without angel because we measured beforehand and two left extensions and then the decoder balloon. And then we experienced this angiogram, which was from the top nice, but there's a large, still a large leak. Very surprising to us. We checked all the overlap, it was good. So um, even reliant once. Uh, uh, so no, this is the extra, extra image. Um, so it seems to come from that left elect axis and we relined it, but we never knew what was the problem. It, it probably is a, a hole in the graft. Unusual, but you can even encounter this in a ruptured case. So closed with proglides and the patient remains hemodynamically stable. Uh, transferred to the ICU. And then the question is early follow-up. I saw that both Zoran and Isabel are in the uh, audience and we have adapted their strategy their post-operative strategy since this year actually only, so not in this patient yet, to go to the CT scan after your endovascular repair. And from there, you decide to go back to theater if the repair is okay, uh, is not okay, sorry, if there is an endo leak or another issue, or you, you go to ICU when the repair is okay. And so on, you go, you can do this three or four times, preferably not, of course, but uh, to get a proper definitive repair and not, um, not get behind because the patient gets unstable in ICU, four hours later, you have to make a CT scan and then you are uh, way behind. So this is the uh, CT scan, which was done on day one, not immediately. Um, and you will appreciate here that the repair is fine, uh, but there's still that AV fistula. It's here uh, depicted in these two extra views. So the patient has a type two endo leak with a persistent filling of that AV fistula. He is, however, hemodynamically stable. There was no bleeding, HB was stable. So we discharged him home on day four. And in the follow-up at six weeks, he didn't have any complaints. Um, uh, and this is his CT at six weeks. And you will appreciate that there is now uh, a persistent AV fistula with a type two endo leak. Um, it's actually larger than it was um, at the uh, post-operative CT, if you compare these two together. So what to do now? Um, there's quite some literature, mostly case reports on these kind of uh, uh, things, but we decided first to measure the aneurysm. And we actually saw that despite this type two endo leak, which persistent and the filling of the uh, AV fistula, there was a significant sex shrinkage in these two directions. So uh, we decided um, to leave it alone and to uh, continue conservative management. We are going to do a six month CTA, which we would normally not do and would do, would do a one year uh, because of this um, special occasion. So I'd like to finish with some Dutch numbers to have a, a Dutch overlay of the, um, this, uh, this presentation. We are not, not that large of a country. We have 17.5 million inhabitants. We have 50 hospitals offering uh, AAA uh, treatment and ruptured AAA treatment. Uh, we have a national registration, so we know uh, uh, how many are done every year. And we see around 500 ruptures, so infrarenal ruptures uh, per year. 50% um, is done via open repair versus 50% with EVAR and our Overall mortality rate over national mortality rate is around 30%. It's going to be probably 40 open and 20 endo. Um, we're currently revising our aortic uh, document, our aortic strategy nationally. And these are the questions that we are currently encountering and that we're 
wondering, um, it's probably too short to have a discussion on, but this is probably what is important. So how to keep all our surgeons and teams trained if we, for example, have only 10 ruptures a year, uh, what is a reasonable minimum center, a number per center or surgeon? And is this for all our for open repair or for EVAR or for both? What is a reasonable distance to travel? We're a small country, but still people don't want to travel in this country for their um, for their healthcare. And, and can we further regi regi regionalize uh, the AAA care? It's very different from Alaska, uh, where Shireen uh, has got her patients from. Um, I'd like to thank you for uh, your attention, and I'll stop sharing. Baron, thank you. That was a fantastic talk and great selection of case. I think large iliac artery aneurysms are very difficult to treat, both uh, in terms of open but also endovascular repair, and in fact more difficult to treat than uh, than your bread and butter aortic aneurysms. And this is for the reasons you sort of highlighted proximity to the iliac veins or the ivc lots of hypogastric branches so if if you're if you're in an open situation you've got difficulty with um uh, hemorrhage control deep inside the pelvis uh, and from an endovascular approach you may get the patient off the table but you've got difficulties later on with with sealing of the aneurysm plus minus uh, an av fistula so thank you very much because that was extremely useful. Do we have any comments from the panel? Paul? Aaron, what were your tips really? So if you've got a big iliac aneurysm, a normal size aorta, Badri, who's uh, recently been appointed as our BSET fellow, is keen for your tips about the, how would you do with the contragate in a narrow aorta? Is it a question for me? Yeah. Ah. Um, so I would leave some room for cannulation and not be too uh, close to the aortic bifurcation. Um, I, um, I think um, we, we choose here for our regular uh, graft that we have in our emergency kit, which has super renal fixation, but it's not really necessary, of course, for a, for a small aorta. Um, I would choose to go the, with the main device through the most difficult iliac access. So your cannulation will be easier for the contralateral gate. That's why I, uh, we choose the left side. Um, and uh, I think that uh, difficult cannulation has become easier with the steerable sheath technology that, we can, that you can easily use from the ipsilateral side uh, and that we use uh, on a weekly basis for our complex um, dark abdominal aneurysms, for example. So when when would you use an AUI? Would you and what would your threshold be of saying of going for an AUI in a crossover? Well, you get me there because we still have AUIs on the in the emergency kit, uh, but we 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 almost never use uh, use them. Um, it's an option to convert to if you have really difficulty. Um, I think we we would do uh, an AUI when there's a combination of not only large iliac aneurysm, but also incredible uh, tortuosity or uh, um, uh, an angulation in which we have had some difficult, really difficult getting graphs up and, and even in an elective case, you would probably use it through a through wire, and then, uh, but, but you, you would probably not be able to do this in in an in a rupture case. So I think if it's a combination of um, of narrow axis, torches axis, large uh, aneurysm, uh, then I think we would convert to an AUI. But we we rarely still do actually. Um. Thank you. Any other comments? Baron, can I? It's a question. I'm you, have you had to take any patients back after their early CT? Um, no, because um, we haven't. We have been doing this only for this uh, year. Uh, but for example, uh, last week or month, I did a thoracic case, uh, um, and and uh, I did it. Um, I did do the CT straight away, and we. Uh, there was it was a, like it was an acute section, so there was still a little bit of false lumen filling, but we thought it was okay, and the patient was stable. 
but we knew what was going on. We did not see this on the completion angiogram. Uh, so uh, it really is another uh, image that you get from your CT than from your completion angiogram. But I have to take, I had to take back patients, for example, with a insufficient infravenal seal uh, in the night. Uh, so did a proper, uh, did an EVAR, shortest neck, good results, stable patients. And then in the, three hours later, uh, unstable, still losing some hemoglobin and then CT angiogram type 1A endoleak. Didn't see this on the, on the angiogram and then had to take, take, take the patient back. So I think it's a, it's a good uh, Zurich proposal, actually. And would you accept the Dyna CT, or do you think that's not good enough for this specific question? Um, we use our Dyna CT uh, usually, so no, I would not accept, because we, we, our experience with Dyna CT is that uh, the combination uh, of contrast with the Dyna CT makes it in our hands difficult to uh, interpret. So we use our, the Dyna CT only after complex repairs for the integrity of the stents and the bridging, bridging and mating stents to see whether they are not compromised by, uh, by anything and well deployed. Yeah. But I, if you have a very good Dyna CT experience and interpretation, I think I would accept that, yes, uh, if it's from good quality. Can I make a comment, Paul? Yeah, go on. A, a, a comment I would like to make, regardless of whether uh, teams opt for open or endovascular approach in, in the case of a rupture, is to not forget that the physiological insult that has occurred before you even laid eyes on the patient. And we've had discussions um, about this in, in, an, in an open case, but also an endovascular case. From an endovascular perspective, you're not after an anatomically perfect technical result. You're after something that will get the patient out of trouble and then you can come back uh, within the first 24 hours or even later. F from an open perspective, it's the same principle. You know, you need to, as long as you've got control and it's not hosing, you need to give all the products, get the patient as stable as possible, and then get the patient off the table and warmed up as quickly as possible if you, if you want to have uh, a, a good result at the end. Because it's not just you know, saving the life within those first 24 hours, but what happens in the first week following a rupture repair. So one last question for all really. So with decreasing numbers of open repair for everyone, how, how do we make sure that our trainees are all going to be prepared for this for the future? What is the secret to it? You know, in both situations, open and endovascular. I'll jump in. So uh, tr training in high volume centers, I think is, is, is key. Um, and it's and it's using all uh, training opportunities, whether they are um, uh, simulated cases, uh, practice cases, discussions, case reviews, attending um, uh, things like this to learn from experience of others. Um, it's it, it is what it is, um, and. Uh, we we have all trained um, in an era of um, uh, where, where training has been uh, difficult, particularly for endovascular surgery uh, for for UK uh, surgeons. But we we have we have trained uh, uh, to do so by following the opportunities, and I think that's what um, uh, that's that's what uh, is necessary. I agree. I mean, I think double and triple scrubbing is not, there's no, you know, shame in that. I mean, you just get over your ego and, and get as much exposure as possible because um, every case is every case you learn from. So, I mean, I think that's really important to stay sharp. I suppose there's, there's one more comment about sort of open surgery in particular is that there are a great many complementary specialties that still operate in and around those difficult areas. 
I reference my hepatobiliary colleagues who are very comfortable in this sort of supraceliac aortic space and, you know, lifting up the liver and doing those slightly more complex exposures, which we wouldn't ordinarily be doing anymore. So I think it's, it's, it's trying to make sure that they have a broad enough open surgical experience where they can also identify very clear, translatable training opportunities to open vascular surgery. But don't you all think it's going to be an illusion to have all those vascular surgeons trained uh, properly in uh, open repair to perform these in acute aortic emergency procedures? We think uh, it's going to be. So I, I see more future in open aortic fellowships uh, and specialized surgeons uh, that, that, are speci that are really open aortic uh, surgery based, uh, because in, in the Netherlands, it's going to be very hard, if not impossible, to have all those uh, uh, people trained properly. What they do now is, for example, regional training. So whenever there's an open case in a neighboring hospital, then the trainee from hospital A moves for that case to, to hospital B. Um, to get more experience. Um, but if you see, Shireen, the, the numbers of uh, open cases that the US trainees have done in their whole training, there's people with five cases uh, that have finished their, their training, isn't it? Uh, no, and, and that is fair. I mean, and certainly we get those referrals, right? With those, those patients get transferred to us. So, I mean, it's, it's easy to sit here and say, oh, you know, everybody's comfortable because we're biased and we see a large volume. But you are correct from that perspective. And I think the end of the day, um, if this is happening, and it is happening, if somebody is not comfortable, I mean, you, you have to get the patient to somewhere where they can get the care they need. Um, and you can facilitate that by quick communication and diagnosis and transfer. Uh, so you can work on systems issues as well to support them. Um, I don't have, I mean, I think if somebody wants to do aortic surgery, they have to either do the fellowship or go somewhere where there's high volume to get the training. Uh, I think uh, someone did put on the chat the impact of COVID on both in terms of ruptures and patients presenting with aneurysms, but also training. And I can give you some data from the UK. We've looked at over 3,000 trainees across the country, all specialties, all surgical specialties. And the overall reduction in logbook numbers was 50%. Um, for some specialties, uh, emergency work was maintained, but for vascular surgery, that didn't necessarily mean ruptured aneurysms. Uh, this has had an impact on recruitment in that main surgery, main specialties in the United Kingdom will not be open to recruitment at all this year because people are not coming, coming off on the other end. Uh, because of poor exposure and experience. So my tip for maintaining skill is attending webinars such as this, uh, familiarization with equipment for all trainees, familiarization with the steps, and attending every single training opportunity that you can. And as Shireen said, there's no uh, sort of, uh, there's no problem with triple scrubbing or even being in the operating theater when there is a major aortic case that is going on. You, you just have to be there. Excellent. So thank you, everybody. Um, what we'd like to do uh, now, just to, to wrap things up, and to uh, say thank you very much to our, uh, uh, to our sponsors in Medtronic. Thank you very much to uh, the panelists uh, for coming and their excellent talks and the time they've put into that. To Celia for being my uh, co-moderator uh, as well. Um, to remind you that there are uh, more uh, of these BSET sessions coming up. Uh, the next one, uh, is next week and hopefully we can see you there. Uh, there are feedback forms which will come out to you to fill in for your CPD uh, as well. Uh, and I hope everyone enjoys uh, the rest of their, of their Saturday, be that uh, early in the morning or late in the evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you all, take care. Bye-bye.